Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. Today is Wednesday, November 17th. This is a recap of the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And here it is, in focus. Out of touch, out of mind. You know this thing we call inflation, which according to the Fed and their allies, it is invisible, doesn't exist. And if it does exist, it is transitory. And if it is not transitory, please stop talking about it. But inflation is rampant right now. Matter of fact, according to the latest CPI, gasoline prices are up about 50% year over year. Rental cars up about 39% year over year. Used vehicles up about 26% year over year. Hotel rooms, 22%. Furniture, 12%. Appliances. 6.6% year over year, food 5.4%, housing 4.5%, etc etc etc. Inflation is all over the place, with notable exception of course, like uh, prescription drugs and airfares, so if you're planning on flying to Vegas with a lot of prescription drugs, you can do that easily and cheaply of course. But for the rest of us homo sapiens, necessities, costs and prices for necessities are surging out of whack. For example, eggs prices up 29% year over year, beef 29% year over year, bacon 28% year over year, ground beef 18% year over year, pork chops up 14% year over year, even sugar is up 12.5% year over year, likewise chicken breast is up 9% year over year, milk is up 8.4% year over year, coffee up 6% year over year. So costs are rising across the board, choking the poor and the middle class. Your shopping bills are going higher, your expenses are going higher, you better cross your fingers that your wages are also going higher, which we know they're not by the way. You're lucky you get a raise. Inflation is rising across the country, specifically in regions with higher poverty rates in the Midwest and the South. Food prices are surging across all urban cities in the United States of America, be it Seattle, Chicago, Detroit, New York, San Francisco, Miami, every single city is seeing substantial increase in food prices. Matter of fact, the IRS is adjusting their brackets due to faster inflation and higher than expected inflation. Even former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, of all people by the way, is warning about rampant inflation and the upcoming stagnation and Japanization of the United States of America due to the Fed's errors and mistakes. Economists across the board now, even the transitory camp are switching over, sounding the alarm that inflation is not transitory and the Fed needs to, res to respond right now by raising raising interest rates higher. CEOs of companies across the board, pretty much every earnings call that we cover, CEOs, CFOs, all sounding the alarm about inflation that is not transitory. And it's not going to be transitory because these companies are not planning on this inflation to be transitory. They're jacking prices higher. They're assuming that this inflation will last for a longer period of time. And this is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy because if these corporations are planning for prolonged inflation, they're going to jack wages higher to retain talent. They're also going to increase prices on us, the end consumer. And this has ripple impacts across the economy. You raise wages higher, will companies have to raise the end cost for the consumer to account for the raise in wages? And when there is a rise in wages, there is demand in the economy including on housing and rents, and therefore rent prices surge higher, etc, etc. Inflation becomes out of control. And today we got stunning numbers from across the ocean at the United Kingdom. Inflation numbers at the highest levels in almost 10 years. Inflation is soaring higher. Matter of fact, prices for housing in the United Kingdom are surging to the highest levels in decades. And by the way, our friends in the United Kingdom, inflation is not going to ease it's only going to go higher and higher and higher. Even if the Bank of England and the ECB cut rates, reduce the coke, it doesn't matter. So long as the Federal Reserve of the United States of America continues the loose money policy and zero interest rates, inflation will continue to surge out of whack 
globally because when America sneezes, the whole world catches AIDS. And companies the lacks of cargo, a warning of higher food costs and food prices for end consumers, and the reason is the rise in wages and the labor shortages will stay with us throughout 2022 and perhaps beyond that. So you get it, the picture is looking dire, consumers are being choked, yes we have stimmies for now, they're drying out though, consumers are dipping into savings to spend and stampede before prices surge even higher during this holiday season. So what are your beloved media personalities, the Biden administration, the Fed and their allies, think about all of that. Take for example MSNBC anchor Stephanie Rule who I like by the way, so this is disappointing because she is a good presenter and she understands economics, yet she's doing this dance, making a donkey out of herself to defend the current administration's policies and the Federal Reserve's policies that are producing this massive inflation. Stephanie Rule says, The dirty little secret is that many Americans can afford inflation. You see in the beginning they said inflation is transitory and now when it appears it's not going to be transitory. They're changing the, the playbook from saying transitory to embracing inflation. Yes, inflation is, inflation is happening, prices are surging, families might be suffering here and there, but look at the bright side. Wages are rising. Most Americans can actually afford a little bit of inflation. After all, we need to benefit our corporations and ultra-wealthy overlords, the oligarchs. And Stephanie joins me now live. Steph, it's great to see as you say, inflation's over 6%, numbers we haven't seen in more than 30 years. So how much higher can these prices go, and when do you see them coming down? Well, listen, Willie, nobody knows exactly when they're going down, but you have to put all this in perspective. This inflation is not in isolation, and the government predicted it was going to be a challenging recovery, recovery all tied to covid so it's why you see things like that expanded child tax credit. You've got the families of over 60 million kids on average getting $430 a month. For people on fixed incomes, older people on Social Security, they're getting those fixed payments adjusted next year up 5.9% for inflation. And the dirty little secret here, Willie, while nobody likes to pay more, on average, we have the money to do so. Yeah, we got the money. We can spend baby spend. Or oh, you don't have money. What's wrong with you? How come you don't have money? Are you like stupid or something? And she goes further by defending the Federal Reserve's failed and dangerous policies. Rule says, Inflation, the clearest action would be for the Fed to raise rates and end purchases of debt securities, but that would cool the job growth and housing. Look back to the early 80s, for example. Rates were in the high teens to cool inflation, which equates to cooling the economy. I cannot believe that she's that stupid, by the way. The action in the early 80s, the Volcker approach, was needed because the country was in stagflation. Inflation was surging out of whack and this was the remedy to control that stagflation. When she says raising interest rates will cool down job growth and housing, are you delusional because the job growth that we have, and I say growth sarcastically of course, because the majority of the jobs we're creating, quote unquote, they're actually being recovered. The leisure and hospitality jobs that were lost in the pandemic. In the lockdowns, and we're just gaining these jobs back. The unemployment rate remains above pre pandemic levels, even after trillions and trillions of dollars were printed. When she says housing, it will cool down the housing market. Yeah, I sure hope so. Have you seen housing prices as of late? Have you seen rent prices as of late pricing out the majority of American families from affordable housing and destroying the American dream for most families? Owning a home becomes impossible. In this kind of inflation. And all I got to say is, you broke my heart, Stephanie. You broke my heart. Now give me a kiss, please. Anyways, she says Americans have a lot of money. We got the cash. We got the money. Let's see if that's true or not. The headline reads, inflation surge is gobbling up many Americans' pay raises. So whatever pay raises, whatever wages you get, poof, gone. Because inflation is going to cancel every and all wage gains in this economy. Here's another headline. Many Suda schools are struggling to feed students after their provider canceled its contract amid the labor and supply chain chaos. It is kind of every district for itself right now, so I guess Stephanie Rule is happy with this. Inflation is good. Come on. Come on, man. Come on, man. What about small businesses, by the way, Stephanie Rule? Are they enjoying this inflation in this uh, economy with labor shortages all over the place? Small businesses, the headline reads, small businesses express growing pessimism 
about the economy, trouble finding workers and higher costs are making small business owners more negative. But hey, hey, this is a great economy. Where is inflation anyways? Is it here? Is it over there? I, I don't see inflation. It's invisible. And if it's not invisible, it's transitory. And if it's not transitory, just shut your mouth. There is no inflation. Uh, buck up. Be patient. And what about this, Stephanie Rule? 44% of low-income Americans are using savings, savings or retirement money to pay bills. 44% of low-income Americans. But who cares about these bums, right? So long as us, in Malibu and Brentwood, so long as we got the money, baby, who cares about all of these bums? Let them eat tents. You know, all of these homeless, you're complaining about me, about wealth inequality, and the 44% of low-income, who cares? Somehow they got tents. Let them eat tents. And if you thought that was absurd, wait till you hear Propaganda Minister Saki. Yep, she's back. She beat COVID. And now, she says, there is no economist predicting higher inflation. Who is predicting higher inflation? I don't hear anybody saying inflation is going to go higher. All I hear is inflation is transitory. And uh, aren't you media personalities supposed to parrot what, ye what we feed you, by the way? Aren't you supposed to say to your audience that inflation is transitory over and over and over and over again? Haven't you forgotten that this is North Korea and we do propaganda here? not journalism, even new Fed chair could happen. New Fed chair, current governor, brain dead. She's not even talking about inflation. What inflation? Well, phew, who cares about inflation? I care about climate change. That's the number one concern from the Fed. Maybe you need to stop the printing machine, Mrs. Brain dead, because that machine, the heat from the machine, the printing machine, that's about 50% of all global warming. And here we have another Fed zombie from uh, Richmond, Barkin, and he says he's happy to wait a few more months to gauge the reality of inflation. Or maybe you want to go to the eye doctor right now because you're not seeing what's going on in this economy. Maybe. I'm not sure. Barkin says, I'm waiting for more data before raising rates. We need more data. You know, retail sales through the roof. That's not enough. The non-farm payroll report, half a million jobs, more than half a million jobs. That's not enough. The CPI over 6% year over year. That's not enough. Double digits inflation in rents, housing, meat prices, oils, cotton, coffee, many grocery items. That's not enough. I want to wait for more data. You know what the solution for all of this is the guillotine. Got to bring back the guillotine. And I'm not saying the real thing, just the statue. You know, like these one, one of these alien statues that appeared in Utah in the desert, and then they started to pop all over the place. We need some hippie artists to create statues of guillotines and place them at the Fed, the Treasury, the SEC, Congress. And watch how the government functions all of a sudden. No deficits, no money printing, normalizing rates, no share buybacks, no corruption. Beautiful. The magic of the guillotine. But if you thought Barkin is delusional, wait till you hear the godmother, the senile leader, Janet Yellen, from the Treasury Department. And of course, they're all concerned about inflation because 2022 is coming, the midterms. Our team is going to get wiped off the planet. They're going to mop the floor with us if inflation continues to rise all the way to the midterms. Virginia was a leading indicator. If inflation is rising higher, consumer confidence is down. Bye-bye seats. So what are you going to do about it before the midterm elections? That's the number one concern for your beloved media personalities. Not the fact that Americans, the poor and middle class, are suffering. Take a listen. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for having us and for making time. Well, thank you for the invitation. You have said that inflation is likely to be with us until the second half of next year. Are you confident that prices for the average American will be down by the time we head into next November and Election Day? Well, it really depends on the pandemic. The pandemic has been calling the shots uh, for the economy and for inflation. And if we want to get inflation down, I think continuing to make progress against the pandemic is the most important thing we can do. I think it's, it's, it's important to realize that the cause of this inflation is the pandemic. It shut, all but shut down our economy. It boosted unemployment to almost 15%. And we've been opening up in fits and starts and um, the pandemic is really responsible in its impact 
um, for the inflation that we're seeing. So now Yellen is saying it is the pandemic. The pandemic is causing disinflation, right? It's not the reckless monetary policy and the cocaine all over the place from the Fed pushing demand out of the out of whack, and we're seeing bubbles all over the place. It's not that. It's the pandemic. It's the virus. I had no clue that one of the side effects of the virus is inflation. Where is my booster shot for inflation? I'm waiting for that one. I mean, what a success that unemployment has declined from almost 15% to under 5% now. Americans feel confident about the job market. Um, quits have increased uh, to record numbers, which is a sign that people are getting um, outside offers, they're seeing wage increases. Um, that is something that didn't have to happen, and um, it really reflects the support that we gave to Americans to keep up their spending and make it through uh, the pandemic. And here she is, she goes into the economy is great, jobs are growing, people are quitting jobs, wages are rising, the economy is beautiful. And the reporter right away confronts her. All of a sudden we have journalists, by the way, and she says, but what about inflation? Take a listen. Our production. 26% year over year for used cars. Yes. Gasoline up 50%, eggs 12%, milk 6%, coffee 6%. So we are seeing some big increases in when prices. does it get better? When do those spikes when the, abate? You know, when the economy recovers enough from COVID that demand patterns, people go back to eating out, traveling more, spending more on services. So again, the question is, when does inflation peaks? When does it end? Janet Yellen says, when people go out and they go to travel and eat at restaurants, ba, 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 ba. well, they're already doing that. Have you looked at the recent retail sales, Mrs. Janet Yellen? Through the roof, they're spending, they're out. Stop blaming the pandemic for failed monetary policies. And by the way, you keep saying wage gains, but wages are rising higher. Out of these trillions of dollars, this massive scam, over $5 trillion. For every $10 spent, printed and spent, by the way, 9 bucks go to the 1% to the corporations, one buck goes to the poor and middle class. And then they take that dollar back via inflation. And not just that dollar, but another one from your pocket. And when all said and done, you're down a buck. But they seduce you. They're gaslighting you. Don't look at this inflation. Yeah, prices are rising higher. But have you looked at your crypto gains? Your stocks gains? Your meme stocks gains? Your wages surging out of whack? Come on, man. Come on, man. But if you thought that was delusional, insane and out of touch. Wait till you hear the demon from Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari. Neil, core inflation's at a 30-year high. Do you think we are at the peak or is it going to get worse? The math suggests we're probably going to see somewhat higher readings over the next few months before they likely start to taper off. We're seeing both a surge of demand because Congress has given a lot of money to families and the businesses to get through the pandemic. But we're also seeing supply disruptions at the same time because of the COVID virus. The good news is both of those should be temporary. The challenge is these high prices that families are paying, those are real and people are experiencing that pain right now. And so we take that very seriously, but I'm optimistic that it should be temporary, even though it is causing pain right now. Okay, are you noticing a pattern here that the playbook has changed from transitory to, yeah, it's bad and families are hurting. We understand that, but cannot raise interest rates right now. We cannot suppress the, this inflation right now. Uh, you gotta buck up and wait for a little more. It's going to be transitory. And if it's not transitory, look at your wages. Wages are rising higher. Yeah, you're suffering. We understand, but you got to wait. How long should we wait, Mr. Kashkari? What is transitory in your outlook? It is causing pain, but many Americans feel like they're being told what they're experiencing isn't real when they're told it's transitory. That word the White House keeps using and the Fed keeps using. You said uh, we won't get back to 2% inflation until 2024. Why do you think it's going to take us that long? Okay, by transitory, he means 2024. Once again, transitory, temporary, means 2024. Four years 
worth of inflation. That makes uh, co college is four years too, right? So that makes college temporary, transitory. How about life? Life is transitory. We stay here for a little while and then poof, we're gone. Life is transitory. How could you be that delusional? How could you say with a straight face that inflation is transitory? Inflation is temporary. And with the same foul mouth, you say it's going to last to 2024. Well, I think both of these things, the demand side and the supply side, are going to take some time to work out. But it's important from the Fed's perspective that we don't set long-term monetary policy uh, and adjust too much based on temporary factors, even if those temporary factors take a little bit longer than we expect. So here it is. He doesn't want to overreact, quote-unquote, overreact to inflation. Buddy, we got the highest inflation in over 30 years. It would be an overreaction if inflation was... 3% year over year, 3.5% year over year. We're talking about 6% year over year, more than 6%. The highest inflation since the 1970s. And you know that you guys printed more money than ever in the history of humanity. And this will produce inflation. But Neil Kashkari says, yeah, if we overreact, it's going to be a problem. What about if you don't react? We're going to have hyperinflation or stagflation. And if we have a hidden accelerator, in the stack of risk in this economy, it's going to light up on fire and the entire economy and the stock market, real estate markets will blow up right away. The risk of no reaction or underreaction is more severe than overreacting. And you're not overreacting right now at all. You're not even tapering, let alone raising interest rates. You're way behind the game, you maniac. But my view is we also need to not overreact to some of these temporary factors, even though the pain is real. You know, the Federal Reserve, when we adjust monetary policy, it acts with a lag. And so if we overreact to a short-term price increase, that can set the economy back over the long term. Exactly. There is a lag. So when the moment finally happens and the Fed realizes that inflation is not going to be transitory and it is getting out of control, there is going to be a lag for the economy to respond to the so-called Fed's tools. What does that mean? It means when you finally realize that inflation is not going to be transitory and you start to tighten, you have to be aggressive, more aggressive than anticipated. You have to slam your foot on the brake aggressively. This is the risk for the economy, for the market, including real estate, by the way. If the Fed slams their foot on the brake aggressively, and you're going to have to do that because you guys are way behind the curve right now. So if there's a lag, that makes it even more dangerous that you're not reacting right now. Continuing with the demon from Minneapolis. Well, looking at, uh, just give some examples. I mean, it really is very sector specific. So a year ago, you couldn't get toilet paper when you went to the grocery store. Now, when I go to the grocery store, the shelves are full of toilet paper. Lumber prices skyrocketed. Lumber prices have now fallen back down to earth. I just read a report before I walked in here that uh, Malaysian chip factories are now coming back online to try to supply auto companies. I also recently learned that all the major auto plants in America have restarted. I'm not suggesting that we're out of the out of the woods yet so at all, but many of these sectors are working themselves out. Some are going to take longer than others. Yeah, Neil, please send somebody to tell my landlord that inflation is transitory and he should take back the 20% increase in rent that he placed on me. Can somebody please talk to my landlord? And here is Neil Kashkari when confronted, what if inflation is a demand pull inflation? What if it is a monetary inflation, not a supply push, not a cost push, not a supply chain bottleneck kind of inflation? This is at least according to Larry Summers. What do you say about that, Neil? Watch how he weasels his way around this question. How about demand? Uh, Larry Summers, a former Treasury Secretary, well-known uh, economist, has been concerned for some time that the Fed is not going to move fast enough uh, and is going to let inflation get so high that the Fed has to move way too fast to pull it back in. He's talking about things like, um, you know, you've got demand-driven inflation, prices rising because of a strong economy, some people going back to work. And it's not just things like commodity prices, uh, firmer housing prices in a hot market and things like that, although they're contributing to it too. Um, what is the risk that this doesn't go away, that it does become entrenched? Well, this goes back to, I mean, I read Larry Summers put out a piece earlier today it goes back to what's the economic theory that a one-time boost of fiscal spending, a one-time boost of demand, it leads to higher prices, yes. 
does it lead to higher inflation, which means ongoing year after year after year, continuing price increases? I don't really understand the mechanism by which Larry Summers thinks that this one term, one time fiscal stimulus leads to a change in the path of inflation, unless he's saying, well, inflation expectations are going to become unanchored. You know, the Federal Reserve is never going to allow that to happen. All of my colleagues and I are paying very close attention to the data. And if we thought that long term inflation expectations were becoming unanchored, we would certainly adjust to make sure that that did not happen. If you look at long term inflation expectations in market indicators, they are not looking like they are coming unanchored or, or very high at all. We're seeing a boost of inflation expectations over the next one, two, three years, maybe even out to four or five years. But that's really driven about the next couple of years. So we're paying very close attention to the data. I just again say, if it, if it, even if you believe it is purely demand driven, a one time boost of fiscal stimulus. OK, explain to me how that leads to long term inflation. Fair enough. OK, let me explain it to you, because the fact that you were asking this question, somebody explains it to me, by the way, is proof that you're not even qualified to be dog catcher, let alone Fed president. You say inflation is going to moderate, meaning that the rate of increase in prices will moderate. So your rent went higher by 20 percent this year. Well, it's going to go down to 15 percent next year. And therefore, inflation is going down. It already peaked. Inflation is transitory, gone, poof, problem solved. The problem is, if my wages don't increase by the same amount, then my expenses went higher. Therefore, my purchasing power is down. My standard of living is down because I have to live with the price increases. Even if the rate of increases moderate, I'm going to have to live up with these prices and not going down. They're not going down. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, the top dog criminal himself, he said prices are not going down. That's not what we mean by transitory. The concept of transitory is really this. It is that uh, the increases will happen. We're not saying they will reverse. That's not what transitory means. It means that the increases in prices will happen. So there will be inflation, but that the process of inflation uh, will stop so that so that there won't be further. Inf what we, when we think of inflation, we really think of inflation going up year upon year upon year upon year. That's inflation. When you have inflation for 12 months or whatever it may be, I'm just taking an example and not making an estimate, then, then you have a price increase but you don't have an inflation process. Let me ask you a question, by the way. All of you listening and watching this show right now, does it really help when the rate of increase in inflation goes down, but you're still paying the extra cost if your wages don't keep up with that extra cost? Does that help at all? Of course not. You used to pay $1,500 in rent. Now you're paying $1,700. Okay, next year you're going to pay $1,800. So in theory, inflation went down. But you're still paying extra cost. If your wages are not increasing higher by the extra $300, your purchasing power is down. Your expenses went higher. Your standard of living is going to go down. And this will happen, by the way, across the economy, not just rent. Meat prices are going to stay the same. Prices are not going to go down. Car prices not going to go down. The price increases are permanent. How does that help, you delusional madman? What is the Biden administration doing about this inflation, by the way? For example, energy prices. At first, they blamed the COVID lockdowns and the reopening. That is the reason behind energy prices and gas prices moving higher. Because more people are traveling, more people are driving, etc., etc. That did not work. They shifted to transitory. It's just going to be transitory. That did not work. They shifted to, oh, it's OPEC and Russia. That's baloney, of course. Now they're saying that there is price manipulation in gas stations and asking the FTC to start to crack down on gas providers. Blame this inflation on price gouging, not the massive speculation in the oil market, by the way, driven by the insane monetary policy and the loose money, not the hostile policies from the administration against oil and gas. These are not the causes for energy prices surging higher. The real reason is price gouging. Wow. We should have figured this one out a while ago before I booked my tickets for Christmas. I got to pay for those jet fuel costs. And now they're considering sending the National Guard to ease the log jam at the ports. They're threatening penalties for cargo ships to unload. If they don't unload in time, they're going to face penalties. Where are the truck drivers? Where are we going to dump all of these containers? They're dumping them in residential areas. They have to do it because 
there are no trucks to pick up the containers. We don't need National Guard. We don't need robot trucks. We don't need any of that. The source of the problem is the cocaine, the excess demand in this economy, the loose money policy. You raise interest rates right now, and magically, all of this inflation goes away. But they're not going to go there. Never. That's going to be the last resort. When everything fails, they're finally going to raise interest rates. They're not going to do it now because it crashes stocks, it crashes real estate market, and that hurts the donor class. What a freak show. Anyways, let's move on with the coverage, starting with the market's performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average, closing in the red, down. 211.17 points, or a decline of 0.58%. The Nasdaq, down 52.28 points, or a decline of 0.33%. The S&P 500, also down 12.23 points, or a decline of 0.26%. What about the sector's performance today? Awful, pathetic, so we're not giving away any medals today. Matter of fact, we're going to shame some names here because the laggards of the day led by energy, financials, and industrials all down, but the losses in energy were massive. And that is due to the declines in energy futures, which we're going to cover in a bit. But before we do that, what about the advance to decline ratios? Again, awful. The NYSE, 28% advancing versus 70% declining. The NASDAQ, 27% advancing versus 69% declining. Now, usually, not always, exaggerated numbers to the downside in the ratios, usually, again, not always, are followed by a rebound day. The problem is the technicals, not so hot so. And we're going to go over all of these charts in a little bit. But before we do that, moving on to futures. What's going on here? Crude oil prices down big. The WTI down almost 4% today, Brent down a little over 2%, gasoline down, heating oil down, natural gas down big, 6% today. And the reason is the psychological impact of the empty threats from the Biden administration, that they're going to crack down on price gouging. Let me tell you something here. So long as inflation continues to rise higher, one of the best hedges against inflation is oil and commodities in general. And therefore, every dip in oil will be bought. On top of that, all of these threats are making oil and gas drilling unattractive at all, and therefore impacting the supply down. If the supply-to-demand dynamic becomes worse due to the psychological crackdown from the Biden administration, then prices will continue to go higher. The only remedy here is to eliminate the speculation in the market by tightening the monetary policy. But of course, they're not going to do that, at least not right now. What about softs? What's going on here? Lumber prices. Remember lumber? Kashkari is talking about lumber. And as he's talking about lumber, prices are surging out of whack again, up over 6% today, almost 7%. Likewise, coffee futures surging out of whack, about 4.5% gains today alone. Likewise, sugar futures gaining over 2% today, cotton futures gaining 2%. Cocoa futures also moving higher today. The only exception is OJ futures moderately in the red. What about metals? Gold and silver with modest gains today, a little over half a percentage point apiece. But we have declines here in platinum and copper. Copper down big, about 3% here. On the other hand, palladium is gaining about 1% or so today. What about meats? They're shifting the contracts here from the December contract to the February contract. And therefore, live cattle futures appear to be gaining over 3.5% today, but the reality is they were moderately in the green. Not to say that live cattle futures are not going to rise higher. The April contract, for example, is trading higher than the nearest contracts. And therefore, the expectations are that live cattle futures will continue to rise higher in the future. Feeder cattle futures pretty much on the flat line, while lean hogs futures losing about 2% today. What about grains? Grains, the best place to be here. We have gains for oats, rough rice, wheat, corn, soybean meal, soybeans, all gaining handsomely today. On the other hand, we have soybean oil pretty much on the flat line, while canola losing about 1.5% today. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far, lots of activities today, pushing Apple higher, even though the market was down, they were pushing Apple higher via options. Over 2 million contracts traded hands today, about 79% of those were calls. At number 2, we have Ford with about 1.5 million contracts, about 96% of those were calls. And then at number 3, we have Tesla with about 1.3 million contracts. 
about 56% of those were calls. And here are the activities from Apple. They were buying the 150 aggressively. Then they rolled over, rolled up to the 152 and a half, and then they rolled up to the 155. Again, they're in and out these contracts within the same day. And their purpose is to push the stock higher by initiating a gamma squeeze. Now, they're blaming retail for all of this mania. I assure you, retail has some hand in this options trading mania with pushing Nvidia higher, Tesla, Qualcomm, etc many other names but behind these pumps resides a very powerful player with sophisticated programs that can spot the under allocation and the under positioning for market makers for certain stocks you combine that with the implied volatility and now you have a screener for the potential for gamma squeeze a big firm a big player is using these tools to spot where the under allocation is and the opportunity for underpriced premiums for options to initiate the pops and they can make 100, 200, even 1,000% within a day. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker GM for General Motors. The president drove the Hummer EV today, promoting GM, and therefore they're buying GM calls aggressively. In this case, they bought the 68 calls for the expiration date, November 26, with expectations that GM could ride higher by more than 5% by then. They paid about 50 cents apiece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.2 million dollars what about the ticker meta m-e-t-a this is the new meta etf another scam of course or oh, amazon is going to be in the metaverse nvidia is going to be in the metaverse netflix is going to be in the metaverse only fans is going to be in the metaverse it's an insane fantasy from a weird nerd who happens to have billions of dollars that's all there is the biggest video game in history and they want us to live inside it. Yeah, people gonna be walking the streets with massive goggles on, stumbling all over the place. 60 years old, they're gonna be wearing glasses, big goggles, to play chess with other oldies somewhere else in the planet. Give me a break. And I know what you're gonna say, but what about the internet, bro? You would have said the same thing about the internet. Uh, if you go back to the 80s, even the 90s, and you ask pretty much every dude on the planet, what if I told you that you can sit on the couch, eat pizza, and you can go online, scroll a little bit, you order goods, and they come at your door within two days? Pretty much every dude in the planet would say, yep, sign me in. That's the future. But a stupid video game with avatars, and let's paddle in the living room, pretending that we're on a surfboard, because I'm playing some stupid game in the metaverse. It's a video game. It is a glorified video game. That's all there is. Wait till you get robbed with your stupid goggles on while you're living in the metaverse. All of a sudden you feel a gun pushing against your back. Back to reality, bro. Take your stupid goggles on and hand them to me. Oh, and by the way, give me your wallet, your phone. And while you're at it, you have some nice clothes. Nice sneakers. Take these off too. I'll send you home with the hair on your back only. Then you can go and complain to the metaverse, to Mark Zuckiniberg. I was playing the metaverse and somebody robbed me in the street. Good luck. But anyhow, they're buying calls here on Meta, the ETF. They're buying the 20 bucks calls for the expiration date, December 17th, with expectations that Meta, Meta, Meta will rise by over 19.5% by then. They paid about 40 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $600,000. What about the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? The buying puts here, the 433 puts for the expiration date, December 23rd, with the expectations. The SPY could drop down by more than 7.5% by then. They paid about 2 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $2.2 million. And what about the trade for the ticker GOEV? We talked about this name last night. I'm out of it. I sold the 12 bucks calls. I sold my shares at 12. I bought back the calls. At a lower price, when GOEV went down today, trading in the red, we're done. In, out, hello, goodbye. All in all, the gains, 38%. Not bad. But perhaps they're betting for more gains to come in this name by buying the 12 bucks calls for the expiration date, November 19th, meaning two days left. With the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 11% by then, they paid about 25 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about a quarter a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker AVDX? This is for 
Avid Exchange Holdings. MasterCard is one of the investors in this company. The name popped higher today by a little over 7% and they're buying more calls, betting on more gains to come. They're buying the 30 calls for the expiration date December 17th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 17.5% by then. They paid about 25 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all, spending about half a million dollars. And what about the trade for the ticker on on and this is for on holdings the name was up big today and they're betting for more gains to come they're buying the 55 calls for the expiration date january 21st with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than six and a half percent by then they paid about six bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker o-p-e-n open open door the name is down but somebody's buying the dip here by buying the 22 calls for the expiration date december 17th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than five percent or so by then and they paid about one buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one million dollars continuing with interesting trades what about the ticker i-o-n-q the name is on fire it continues to go higher and higher and higher and they're betting for more gains to come here by buying the 35 calls for the expiration date december 17th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 10 and a half percent by then they paid about five bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three million dollars watch out here from following this trade though because you're gonna have holders selling a lot of calls at this point to capture the implied volatility aka calling a top what about the ticker USO for the United States Oil Reserves, or Oil Fund, I should say. Biden is threatening to crack down here. Stop price gouging. That's the problem. And who knows if the Biden administration will administer trolls and traders, and perhaps their allies in hedge funds and the likes, to manipulate the energy market down. They can release the Fugazi numbers, of course. Oh, all of a sudden the supplies are up. All of a sudden our inventories are up. Wow, we found some inventory. And if that doesn't work, just employ some hedge funds and some uh, market manipulators to buy some puts on the USO. Problem solved. The buying puts on the U by the way, I'm not saying that this is what's happening. I'm just saying it could put your conspiracy hats on. But in this case, for this trade, they're buying the 52 puts for the expiration date, December 17th, with the expectations that the USO could drop down by more than five and a half percent by then. They paid about 95 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about six hundred thousand dollars. What about the ticker MARA for Marathon uh, Tulips? whatever it is the buying calls here the 60 calls for the expiration date december 10th with the expectations that mara could pop higher by more than 17 and a half percent by then they paid about four bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two million dollars and then we have big bets for tesla tsla aka the souffle the buying puts here the 1020 puts for the expiration date november 26 with the expectations that tsla could drop down by more than six and a half percent by then and they paid about 15 and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about seven million dollars and lastly at the bottom of the table we have tsla once again the souffle but they're buying calls this time around they bought the 1275 calls for the expiration date december 17th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 17 percent or so by then they paid about 22 cent 22 cents 22 bucks a piece bringing the total all the way to nine million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here we have a bloodbath across the board the market is down but we have few exceptions here bucking the trend namely apple this is due to the options activities tesla similar story here the battle between the shareholders the culties and the cult leader elon musk dumping on the little heads and then we have gm we know the story here biden is visiting gm goes up we also have tgx tj max nice earnings here and the name's popping higher we have moderna about to get an fda approval for the boosters surging higher lots of short covering here and of course the top dog the biggest criminal organization pfizer surging higher why not the government's buying all of these pills the new pfizer pills for 500 bucks a pop this is taxpayer money being washed all the way back to pfizer 500 bucks a pop and it gets even worse with Merck. The government is paying 700 bucks a pop, but it appears that the government will favor Pfizer this time around, and therefore Pfizer is shooting up higher. You want to be in these criminal stocks, 
because they tend to outperform the market. Anyhow, we're moving on to charts, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? By looking at the chart, we have a pop higher in the morning, a reversal closing at the lows of the day. Not a good look here. We're still eyeing the support of 462 and then 4. 53. But what is the chart looks like right now? Here's one way to look at it from a 30 minutes perspective, of course. We have a trend line. The trend line has been broken. Another way to look at it is a formation of a head and shoulder. Another negative formation, by the way. And here's another way. What if this a bear flag formation? So we have multiple formations here. All of them on the bearish side. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY? Could it provide a different perspective we'll see here it is not really we have the momentum indicators running out of gas curling down about to cross to negative divergence it appears that we have a double top for now the chart has till the end of the week to close above the previous top and therefore avoiding the double top formation but for now it appears that we're gonna have the double top formation which will be followed by a flush down what about the cues? What's going on here? Still trading above the support was resistance, but still support for now, 396. Here's one way to look at it. The trend is still intact, but we have what it appears to be a bear flag formation. Can the daily chart on the continuous contract offer a different perspective? Perhaps, but not really, because the momentum indicators are already curling down and about to shape negative divergences. We also have a shooting star pattern on the candlesticks. In all likelihood, it appears to be that we're going to have the reverse ABC pattern, which will take the NASDAQ down. Of course, the NASDAQ has till the end of the week to avert this scenario. You can do that by, ma by making higher highs. We'll see if the NASDAQ is able to do that by the end of the week. In all likelihood, though, not going to happen. And here it is, the IWM, the Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Breaking the support, now resistance of 237.5. And the chart is forming a bear flag formation, indicating that perhaps the next destination will be the next support at 233. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? what's going on here pulling back from the resistance showing a topping formation 96 the macd the rsi all topping here could it happen could this be the top in the us dollar maybe but watch out here for tricky dixie and the reason is the dollar was down due to the surge in the british sterling right after the uk inflation data the sterling went higher and the dollar took a dive down but the last time it happened it was a bear trap because the dollar right away reversed the losses and started trading higher again. So watch out here for making any assumptions without confirmations. What about the chart of gold? What's going on here? Popping higher. Three enemies are down. The Dixie, at least for now, the 10-year yield went down today. And Bitcoin, tulips, also went down. Could it be the comeback of gold? Could it be? It all depends if the market becomes rational again and says, you know what? Inflation is out of whack. We have to seek inflation hedges. Commodities already bloated. They are a proven hedge against inflation, of course. But if the dollar is rising, then we're going to move away from the over bloated commodities to perhaps gold. Yes, gold's, gold underperforms when the dollar moves higher. But perhaps the over suppressed levels and the massive consolidation in gold for a long time now, perhaps. It will be attractive for traders and investors to hop in and buy gold. We'll see. But you probably want to see the dollar confirming the downside from today and the 10-year yield also closing down for another day, perhaps closing below 1.5% again by the end of the week. It could happen, but it's a long shot, at least for now. Here's the chart for the 10-year yield. What's going on here? We had the reverse head and shoulder popping higher, but reversing right away. Could it be a knee-jerk reaction to the 20-year bond auction that we got today? It could be. And therefore, we don't have confirmations here that yields are down, the dollar is down, which is, by the way, a good combination for the stock market. But for now, we're having all of these divergences and confusion all over the place. We need to sort all of these divergences by the end of the week, specifically for yields and the dollar. What about the TLT? What's going on here? Weekly chart still below 149. A lot of Fed zombies came out today from Williams to Mr. All pointing out that the Fed has to maintain and support the treasury market. What's going on here? Are they seeing something we're not seeing? But for now, this is pushing the bond market higher, at least for now. What about the VIX? Four hours chart, what's going on here? We have a little crossing for now. 
not confirmed yet. But if it is confirmed overnight via futures, the VIX futures, then the VIX will pop higher tomorrow, starting tomorrow. And perhaps it will close the week above 20, and this will be a massive win for bears. And the double top formation in the SPY will happen. So watch the MACD indicator on the 4 hours chart for the VIX closely. Moving on to Apple, a daily chart, what's going on here? The options market activities took Apple higher to close above 150 once again. Yet the real test is, can Apple close the week above 150 or not? Or was today just a mere gamma squeeze in the options market? We'll see. Moving on to a daily chart for Tesla, the souffle, what's going on here? The chart managed to close the gap from yesterday, but in doing so, it opened another gap. And this will be a target for put options traders. It will be a small profit, of course. But for now, there is a massive appetite in buying call options and buying the dip in Tesla, even though the CEO is dumping. Message not received by the culties. They continue to buy. The good news is... The RSI is curling up higher. The MACD is also curling up higher. But we're not out of the woods yet until, unless, the chart closes above. Pay attention now. Above the breakdown candle. You see that massive red candle to the downside? This is the dump of Elon. You can buy that as an NFT. And that number is 1,173 and a half. If the chart closes above that number, then you're going to see higher highs in Tesla. Absent of doing that, then the chart will revisit the initial target of 900, closing the gap. And then if that fails to rebound, then we're going to revisit target number two, which happens to be the trend line. Moving on to tulips, what's going on here? BTC, still holding, not flushing down, but the momentum indicators are negative now. And I'm not going to touch it until I see how it reacts at around 55,300. And by the way, the recent rally in gold, it's not really a ratty it's a revival it's moving higher it is capturing attention right now this is a significant development by the way because you're going to see some money perhaps some rational money from conservative funds who bought bitcoin or tulips because their clients wanted them to do so and they're up big now they're going to say you know what let's book some profits from btc and rotate those profits to gold if that dynamic happens btc down gold up which is the rational way. But you have to remember, we're not in a rational market anymore. Moving on to AMC, what's going on here? AMC failed to close the gap and now lost the support of 42 and a half. And the chart is forming a bear flag formation, it appears so, at least for now. What does that mean? The next destination could be 39, the next support. And by the way, here's another way to look at the chart. We could be seeing a head and shoulder formation. So we have multiple negative formations happening in AMC, just like we're seeing in many other charts. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims, and then we have the Philly Manufacturing Index, and then we have other Fed zombies speaking. Notice how many zombies we had speaking this week. What's going on here? What are they beating the drum for? Lastly, what about the earnings calendar? In the morning, we have Alibaba, and after the bell, we have AMAT, aka Applied Materials. And then lastly, we're going to have Workday. This will be important. We're also going to have Macy's. We might cover Macy's if there is a significant development. We're also going to cover the earnings that we got today from Target, Lowe's, Cisco, NVIDIA, TJ Maxx. We're going to cover all of them in the show tomorrow because I'm already recording this one too late. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.